gli spaghetti, non abbiamo ancora porlo il vino, eh, bisogna sbrigarsi perché domani passiamo per il giro del mondo, vero? La cosa è tutto il mondo, è stremo formidabile, è che c'è un grande danno di santé, un giacchetto, un grande The Whitbread Round the World Race starts in a depressing downpour. First away are Flyer, Heath Scondor and Great Britain too. In the free wind, Yappy Hermes, with her blue and white spinnaker, is well up, crewed by French students from Marseille. Debenham skipper John Ridgway is famous for rowing across the Atlantic and is interested in the race as a test of human endurance. He makes a slow start and is quickly overtaken by Trait de Rome, a unique common market entry. To seaward are Trois Expos and King's Legend. Despite the heavy rain, a large spectator fleet turns out to cheer the 15 yachts from five different nations as they set out from Portsmouth to race 27,000 miles around the world with Cape Town as the first port of call. Under a cloud of spinnaker and blooper, Heath's Condor, the biggest boat, arrives first at Bembridge Ledge Boy. Next is King's Legend, with Great Britain 2 passing astern, but sailing faster on a more direct line at the start of her third voyage round the world. King's Legend, rigged as a sloop, is one of three Swan 65 yachts taking part. She's racing under the British flag with a partly American crew. Dutchman Cornelis van Rietschoten had flyer designed by Sparkman and Stevens and built specially for this race. Setting her tall boy, in addition to spinnaker, main and mizzen staysail, the 65-foot aluminium catch makes full use of the following wind. Flyer is one of the most thoroughly prepared boats, with 10,000 sea miles to her credit, including a transatlantic race victory. The Swiss entry, Die Store, is a member of a formidable team, together with King's Legend and Flyer competing for the Long John Trophy. She is one of the three yachts in the race, who are sister ships to Sayula, winner of the first Whitbread Trophy, and like her, built by Norto in Finland. Distor and ADC Accutrack are both Swan 65 catches. ADC Accutrack is renowned for her girl skipper, Claire Francis, with husband as crew. And the French veteran, Chantra Expo, as a 23-year-old skipper for her second race around the world. To starboard is Tilsa, another Dutch shot. Debenham's figurehead is John Ridgway's petite wife, Marie Christine. She's well accustomed to hardship from sharing her husband's previous adventures. By evening, the yachts are strung out in a line, making for Ashant. Heath's Condor has a 93-foot experimental carbon fibre mast. She's the highest rated yacht on handicap, but she's hoping for line honours. Past the Canaries, Adventure picks up the steady northeast trades and chooses her course for the lottery of the Dolphins ahead. With a girl at the helm, the boys get on with the needlework. Adventure's joint service crew will be changed at each port of call. Friendly dolphins are the most entertaining and welcome of visitors. They delight in the sport of riding on the bow wave as the pressure gives them a lift, and playing and diving under the bows, always skillfully manoeuvring to avoid both the yacht and each other.
idling sails and continuously snatching blocks are anathema to a racing crew. In the clammy, hot atmosphere of the doldrums, the crew of Great Britain too can only hope their rivals are equally frustrated. As the winds pick up, benefiting from her fighting passage through the doldrums, spinnaker sheets constantly in hand, Flyer is challenging strongly for the lead. Disaster strikes Heath's condor. The top of her carbon fiber mast snapped with the strain of the strongest headwind yet, causing a second break as it fell over the side. With fine seamanship, within two hours, the crew have set sail again under improvised jury rig. With a downwind speed of six knots, they make for Monrovia, where a conventional aluminium mast is flown out from Britain and fitted with a total delay of only nine days. But a crucial delay for Condor, costing her all chance of winning the overall prize. Meanwhile, the fleet are heading into the southeast trades, hoping to avoid the South Atlantic high, its centre wandering as much as 800 miles a day. For the fortunate who guess correctly, it's a wet windward slog all the way to Cape Town. Flyer is fighting a duel with King's Legend. In conditions that should favour the sloop, the Dutch catch is showing remarkable ability to windward, at times pointing higher and sailing as fast. The South African Air Force Shackleton sights King's Legend on the final run-in. The two level-rated yachts have been pacing each other all the way from the equator, cross-tacking twice. But Flyer is first. As she sails into Cape Town, She's also first on handicap. Calling your flyer, congratulations and a very special welcome from the Royal Cape Yacht Club. <laughs> We had some beautiful sailing. It wasn't as rough as we had expected, and it was more like a Mediterranean cruise. King's legend arrives two hours later, after 38 days at sea. The two yachts, once tacked within a quarter of a mile of each other, went still a thousand miles from Cape Town. Skipper Nick Ratcliffe must feel keen disappointment. The two crews put aside their intense rivalry and exchange stories, sharing each other's unique experiences. Gulwaz, the oldest boat, is lying third and has just fitted a specially strengthened rudder to face the rigours of the Southern Ocean. Crete de Rome is the first boat to sail under the unique European flag. Great Britain too comes up to the start in the light southwesterly headwinds. Point Starting alone at the port end of the line, Great Britain 2's fee-paying crew sail off on port tack with plenty of room to manoeuvre. Dave Leslie skippers Adventure's new service crew. While the beautiful swan, Distor, on starboard tack, includes amongst her crew a Swiss ice hockey player, two doctors, a sailmaker, a mast maker, a dinghy champion for skipper, and a goldsmith as cook. Flyer tacks astern of Distor in the long beat out of Table Bay.
Keith's Condor has her crew sitting out, looking all set for an inshore race around the boys. On this leg, Robin Knox Johnston has taken over as skipper from Les Williams. He's setting a course well to seaward, mindful of the frustrating memories of some of his experienced crew during the first Whitbread race, when they were calm for hours inshore in Table Bay. Flyer 2 stands well out to sea. Her crew, determined to maintain their lead, are looking forward to renewing their private race with their chief rival, the level-rated swan, King's Legend. Uninhibited by past experience of the land wind shadow, the crew of King's Legend take a big chance, sailing close inshore on a more direct course. Sophisticated navigational instruments are an invaluable aid to the yachts in making maximum use of the light headwinds. Off Slankop Lighthouse, by the late afternoon, King's Legend has sailed into a clear lead. As the yachts set out on their 7,500 mile voyage to Auckland, New Zealand, Cape Point bids them a rugged farewell as they head out for the Roaring Forties. Flyer's crew drive the boat hard, making constant sail changes for maximum speed. Spurred on by radio reports, the King's Legend is 350 miles ahead. Their skipper takes the helm himself in his determination to close the gap. Warm drink thaws out numbed fingers on Great Britain too. Robin Knox Johnston checks his position with a sun sight. No. As Heath's Condor sails down to 55 degrees south, it grows steadily colder. But even snow showers can't dampen the crew's enthusiasm at having gained the lead, at times covering more than 250 miles a day and surfing at speeds up to 30 knots. In the increasing wind, the spinnaker needs to be smothered quickly. The halyard has jumped the block and jammed at the masthead. It must be cleared rapidly before the sail takes control of the boat. Continual gales and huge seas soon bring damage. Booms and poles break during broaches. 
sails need constant repairs from continuous chafe and tears caused by the sheer strength of the wind. Slow and painful work for frozen fingers. Spinnakers are torn to shreds with repeated blowouts. All equipment needs constant maintenance. And the rigging needs careful checking for signs of weakness. New Zealander Peter Blake homes in on Cape Ranga Lighthouse on the tip of North Island. A sign that land is near. A lonely shag drops in to strike up a friendship with Heath Condor. Making a landfall after thousands of miles at sea is something you can only appreciate if you've sailed the distance. Out on the Waitemata Harbour, this is Pete Montgomery for Radio New Zealand. Skipper Robin Knox Johnston and his crew aboard Heath's Condor now have the Auckland finish line for the second leg in sight. And what a great thrill it must be for them to have a reception like this. Tens of thousands of Aucklanders are around the shores of the Waitemata, over on the North Shore, up on Mount Victoria and North Head, and on the Southern Shores, thousands are up on Bastion Point. There's a traffic jam on Tamaki Drive, and if there were any more people on Iraqi Wharf, I'm sure it would sink. Out on the water, Heath's Condor is being escorted to their line on his victory for the second leg by a small armada of spectator craft. And in the middle of it all, there's an Auckland Harbour Board tug with their fire hoses going. It all adds up to a great antipathy and welcome halfway around the world for the first yacht to reach New Zealand. After thrashing through the Southern Ocean from Cape Town, it's only taken the big 77-footer 30 days and 6 hours to sail the 7,600 nautical miles. Heath's Condor, welcome to Auckland. Trontra Expo takes the handicap prize despite a broken boom. The Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron provides tremendous hospitality for the yachts. In the beautiful city of Auckland, surrounded by the sea, the entire population seems interested in boats. Unlucky girl was, having lost her rudder and returned to Port Elizabeth for a replacement, is last into Auckland. Flyer loses her battle with King's Legend by only one and a quarter hours and after 8,000 miles. B and B Italia and Debenhams cross the line together. The Christmas holiday has given the crews the chance to relax before the Boxing Day start. Trade to Rome, a former Admiral's Cup boat, is one of five yachts in the race designed by Sparkman and Stevens. She's well placed on handicap having sailed into second position in Auckland. Hundreds of spectators collect on Marsden Wharf to cheer the boats on their way. Great Britain too and Contra Expo have jumped the gun, being carried across the starting line too soon by the following tidal stream. But both decide to continue, incurring a time penalty rather than return. While Heath's Condor, with local New Zealanders amongst her crew, makes a better start. on holiday and every available craft is afloat in the harbour to give a grand farewell to the yachts setting out for Rio de Janeiro via Cape Horn. The fleet racing out through Rangitoto Channel in choppy waters churned up by the massive armada of spectator craft makes for a boy which has to be left to starboard. Great Britain too leads Condor at the boy. After the three-mile sail from the start, the next group of boats arrives in surprising order, with low-rated adventure particularly well up. Right up. Okay. Make it up there. Third is ADC Accutrack, who's tripped early, 
and fourth and fifth are Adventure and Neptune. Adventure, holding onto her spinnaker all the time and handled most efficiently by her new crew under a Royal Navy skipper for the horn leg, takes Neptune's wind. Trentra Expo, sixth, has released her spinnaker early, but King's Legend holds onto hers, gaining on the French boat. Yappy Hermes has rounded the boy in eighth position and is surprisingly ahead of Flyer as the yachts turn east and sail across the sheltered waters of Haraki Gulf. Next is Gulwaz trying to tame her spinnaker. Tielsa is also having a struggle to gather in her sail in the beat to windward. Straight to Rome, the smallest boat, brings up the rear. This door, misled by a radio broadcast that gave her crew the false impression they'd been over the line at the start, returns unnecessarily to recross the line. This sporting gesture loses her a whole hour, a long time in this incredibly close fort ocean race, with only minutes separating the arrivals of some of the yachts. After two legs and 14,000 sea miles, Flyer is still first on handicap, but her lead over King's Legend has been reduced to only 47 minutes. huge waves in excess of 20 knots requires extreme concentration from the helmsman to prevent the yacht from broaching. Usually the helm is changed every hour and most boats have two or three really experienced helmsmen to steer the yacht in the worst conditions. Sailing amongst icebergs brings the need for a continuous lookout, but they're less of a hazard now than on the previous leg, as by January the Arctic twilight never turns to darkness. Spectacular but awesome, like great ghost ships, the bergs majestically sail the southern seas. Waves crashing high against their towering cliffs of ice bring a powerful reminder 
at the tremendous forces of nature. crew makes certain the famous landmark is recognized. Cornelius van Rietschoten exercises the skipper's privilege and takes the helm himself to sail his yacht round Cape Horn. Surely the memory of a lifetime. In good conditions, flyer passes two miles to the south. Heath's Condor, too, has the good fortune to pass round the Horn in perfect visibility to see the great rock rising out of the sea. She's only 12 miles astern of Flyer, gaining on her in the freshening and squally wind. But ahead of them both is Great Britain, too, who was first past the Horn, having a glorious sail through the Le Maire Strait with the snow-capped mountains of Staten Island showing over to the east before setting her course to pass west of the Falklands. HMS Endurance, the Royal Navy survey ship, is on station near the Horn. Flyer, heading northward into the South Atlantic in a freer wind, is the first yacht spotted by the helicopter. Heath's Condor is the next to reach Endurance. The watch call out a sleepy Les Williams who takes the helm. A very experienced ocean yachtsman, Les has taken over again as skipper for the difficult third leg. But it's the first time he's rounded Cape Horn under sail. Incredibly, Heath's Condor and Flyer are now in sight of each other. Condor has sailed further south than the Dutch yacht, which she's slowly overtaking. The French yacht Neptune has a crew member with an injured hand, and she gratefully accepts the spontaneous offer of special medical supplies lowered to her by helicopter, hovering skillfully close to her swaying mast. ADC Accutrac shies like a frightened horse as she meets the wake of endurance. Deloise, wallowing in the very light wind, is better known as Eric Tavoli's Penduic Three. She's still a formidable contender and looks all set to win the handicap prize for the third leg after the disappointment of her rudder trouble on the second, which has cost her all chance of winning the race. Under the watchful eye of endurance, Yappy Hermes finds it's a good time to send a man up the mast. Soon, her doctor, Jean-Louis Sabali, is to be involved in a courageous swim across to Trontois Expo to give urgent medical attention to a crewman with a badly broken leg. Tread de Rome has blown out all her spinnakers and her European crew are busily engaged in sail repairs hoping to keep up their good performance on handicap. In this evenly matched race, Tread de Rome and Yappy Hermes are the second pair of yachts to sail by in sight of each other. Debenhams has sailed further south than any of the other boats. She's sporting a banner proclaiming closed Mondays for staff training.
Great Britain, too, is struck by lightning and her navigational aids are burnt out. Rio Yacht Club calling. Rio Yacht Club. All the yachts are becalmed off Rio. Attention, Tretad Rum, Tretad Rum. This is Rio Yacht Club calling. Ever. This is Rio Yacht Club. Rio Yacht Club calling. Tretad Rum. Great Britain, too, has triumphed remarkably over her navigational difficulties, beating Condor into Rio by nearly half an hour. Rio Yacht Club calling. Tretad Rum. Attention, Tretad Rum, Tretad Rum. This is Rio Yacht Club. The light breeze from the south gives the yachts a perfect start for the final leg in overcast conditions. Great Britain too, again the exception, is starting on port tack but gains no advantage, while the rest of the fleet on starboard tack have an escort of international sailings in Rio for their world championships. Flyer is now so far ahead on handicap for the whole race, with a lead of nearly 60 hours over King's Legend, that only a serious mishap can deprive her of the Whitbread Trophy. There's a last chance to sunbathe. With 15 knots on her new Brooks and Gatehouse Harrier, replaced in Rio after the lightning strike, despite a broken boom, Great Britain too is surfing along towards a rainbow after frustrating periods of calm. Once cleared of the Azores High, all the yachts pick up strong westerlies as a particularly deep series of depressions starts to form. On flyer, Chris Merzelin in yellow oilskins inserts the winch handle to raise the heel lift of the spinnaker pole. To prevent chafe, the angle is now awkward, the winch heavily loaded, and the brake difficult to release. He's only four days from Portsmouth, and he's done the work many times before. Ow! The winch handle has hit the back of his hand, which is now useless, but Flyer's doctor says no bones are broken. Heath's Condor's wet spinnaker, like a balloon about to burst, has just been retrieved from the sea. But she's the first boat home to the Solent, having stormed up the channel in a Force 9 in very steep seas, as dangerous as the Southern Ocean. And the spinnaker has gone. It's a spectacularly expensive final run home. In full view of the world's press and television cameras, she's ripped her mainsail too. finishes and a headsail alone. As Heath's Condor glides into HMS Vernon, to the berth she'd left seven months earlier, there's a great welcome waiting from loved ones on the quayside. King's 
legend is already starting her party with a little outside assistance. Swan 65 yachts filled three of the first five places, with King's legend in second position. As Flyer approaches the needles, rolling wildly under her big spinnaker, there's a full gale blowing against the spring tide in the zone. Van Rietschoten, winner of the Whitbread Round the World Race, is welcomed by the organizers, the Royal Naval Sailing Association. He has built and sailed his own yacht to victory in the world's toughest ocean race. An unforgettable experience, bringing him adventure, comradeship, and the Whitbread Trophy. <laughs> <laughs> 